Uh, H.J. Chukma, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very good to have you all with us. I want to uh, extend to you a warm welcome on behalf of, on behalf of the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Blackwell, and I work as the General Counsel and Chief of Staff for NCAI. It's my honor to welcome you to this first webinar in our four-part series, which launches NCAI's groundbreaking Why Native, Business, Native Small Businesses Matter and How to Grow Them animated video series. Uh, this series of three short videos is designed to educate current and future tribal leaders, key decision makers, citizens, and other Indian country stakeholders and non-native policymakers about the vital importance of native owned small businesses to the rebuilding of vibrant native economies and how tribal governments can best support the cultivation of a vibrant small business ecosystem in and around tribal lands. Um, I want to take a, a short break from some of the prepared remarks here and say to all of you, this is an issue that for me personally is very, very near and dear to my own heart. Um, I uh, once upon a time served on the board of the National Small Business Association, and it was quite a uh, an eye opening experience to come from Indian country and spend time with small business owners around the United States and uh, to see the differences, to see how much more challenging it was in Indian country and how difficult it was for small business owners across the U.S. to relate to our issues in Indian country. And, and not just cultural and historical differences, and, uh, but the nature of, of tribal economies and challenges associated with very basic uh, key things for small business owners, small businesses uh, like, like taxation, or uh, collateralization, uh, being able to build debt. Uh, so it was, it was, um, I knew it's a, it, it was a, it was a big challenge for me. I know that it's a big challenge for others. It's a very important part of tribal economies and a, and a huge uh, growth area potential for our tribal citizens and those at home and abroad. Um, the other thing that I, I have a view into the operations of uh, tribal small businesses for, for the better part of, my goodness, almost two and a half decades now have been involved in advocacy for tribal nations and for individuals uh, to get better broadband, better telecommunications infrastructure. And there are so many small businesses in the United States right now that operate on broadband networks. Well, it's one of the major priorities to for us at NCAI to help develop the infrastructure of Indian country to be able to support all of the components of our, our economies at home and most certainly native small businesses. So uh, back to some, uh, some remarks that uh, the esteemed uh, Kobe has, has uh, prepared for me a little bit. Uh, just wanna tell you a little bit about our webinar today. Uh, we're gonna focus on traditional native economies, the critical role that native entrepreneurs played in those economies and the growing movement among tribal nations to revitalize and grow the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit that once served as the bedrock of our economies. To delve into this topic, we're honored to have with us today Elsie Meeks and Cecilia Inglehart. Elsie Meeks is the former executive director and CEO of First Nations Awista Corporation. She also serves on, as the board chair for the Lakota Funds, a small business development loan fund on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Cecilia Ingerhart is a native small business owner. She also served as Indigenous Community Wealth Building Coordinator with Hope Nation LLC. And she currently serves as a board member with the native nonprofit Seven Fires. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming today to participate in this. We very much look forward to what you have to say. Um, this is very important work. And it's something that, that uh, NCAI is, is happy to be involved in and myself personally as well. So please think of me again, Jeffrey Blackwell at NCAI, please think of me as a resource to you. So with that, I would like to introduce Kobe. He's, uh, Kobe is our team lead on, um, staff lead on NCAI's development of this animated uh, video series. I had an opportunity to take a, a preview of it and uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So um, thank you, Kobe. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. 
Uh, and thank you everybody for, for taking time out of your day to join, uh, <clears throat> join this webinar. Um, like Jeff said, certainly sharing that excitement. Uh, my name is Kobe Clark. I'm a citizen of the United Home and Nation. I serve as a policy associate and executive committee liaison at NCAI. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, was the staff lead on development of this project. Just wanted to provide a quick background uh, on how this project came about uh, before turning it over and, and showing you guys the videos and getting into this first webinar. So the funding for this project comes from Google, from their Tides Foundation, uh, focusing on small business development in Indian country. Uh, a large portion of the funding went directly to native small business owners in the form of micro grants. Uh, and then the other portion was to develop this resource uh, and distribute wide across Indian country. So uh, first step in that process, um, I want to first acknowledge Dr. Ian Record, who will serve as the moderator for today's session, um, who was instrumental in, in bringing this project to the finish line. Um, with Dr. Record, we worked with experts across Indian country, uh, entrepreneurs, professors, tribal leaders, uh, and so many more uh, throughout the scripting of the videos, uh, the animation itself, um, and, and every other step along the way um, to, to develop this resource to, to what it is today. Uh, so a special thanks to everyone who played a role throughout that entire process. Um, and so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Record uh, to outline the focus of each of the three videos that will be part of this webinar series uh, and how this resource will build on the recently released Building Tribal Economies Toolkit um, that was released by NCAI back in November. So without further ado, uh, please take us away, Dr. Record. Thank you so much, Kobe. I uh, appreciate it. And thank you to Jeff for the, the warm welcome. And Kobe, it's been great to work with you and, and our many content contributors from across any country on this project. Um, this is an exciting project. It's it's something that we, um, uh, NCI has been working on for several years now. Uh, we actually had this idea in place uh, when I was on NCI staff um, and we're getting ready to start mo moving on it. And then COVID hit and you know, the priorities became the, the priorities and, and everyone had to pitch in and uh, help any country recover. And, um, but this is exciting. This, this um, as Kobe just mentioned, it builds on the um, Building Tribal Economies Toolkit, which uh, Suzanne just placed in the, um, in the chat, uh, which you can download. It'll be available along with some uh, related resources shortly on NCAI's new website. And it really dives into, um, what many of us have talked about for, for years, and as Elsie mentioned before, we came on live on the webinar for decades. Um, it's it's what, what many Native people have long felt in their hearts is something that needs to be um, focused on and revived um, with much greater strength than perhaps it, it, it was in, in, in previous years. And um, we wanted to take this opportunity to um, share these longstanding um, messages from, um, from any country itself about the importance of this. This is not an, an abstract academic exercise. This is um, um, reconnecting with um, traditional native economies that were that were honed over thousands of years, disrupted by colonization, and then are now um, experiencing a self-determined rebirth. And it's no, it's no coincidence that entrepreneurship is at the heart of a lot of that um, work and a lot of that um, progress. And so we wanted to get um, these messages out to any country again in, in, a, in a new and different format in a way that can really engage with how people learn today. Um, animated infographic videos, explainer videos, as they've been called, um, they're, they're a way to learn um, key things in, in just a short amount of time. And so that was the goal with this is to be visually compelling, visually engaging and have very concise messages that that everyone can understand and, and to be able to learn quite a deal, a great deal in just, you know, 11, 12 minutes of time. And so that's what we've done with these three videos. And um, the first one uh, focuses on traditional native economies uh, and, and how entrepreneurship played a vital role in, um, in sustaining and growing those economies and how um, native communities place great emphasis on what is known in, in modern economic terms as the multiplier effect. They understood the value, the power of 
uh, fostering and growing local systems of commerce where you turned over within the community, circulated within the community assets of value um, of, of various types and, um, and how this was done in very sophisticated and advanced ways by native communities um, individually and then collectively through trade with one another. The second video focuses a great deal on how colonization disrupted all of that and some of the enduring legacies of some of those um, devastating uh, federal and state policies uh, and also corporate intrusion. And then the third, um, the third video um, really um, dives into the, the renaissance that's taking place when it comes to Indian country entrepreneurship and what the evidence shows, what the research has shown, what native people, native leaders themselves are saying are the key strategies for creating that strong ecosystem for the, the folks in your community that are looking to um, start and grow small businesses for, the, for that ecosystem to really support their ability to take root and grow. And so without further ado, I want to I want to have Suzanne now um, play the three videos. And then um, after that, we're going to we're going to join our panel and, and have a robust conversation about some of the key themes that were raised in these videos. Suzanne. It is a native economy. It's the constellation of self-governed economic activities a native people choose to do together in accordance with their cultural, social, ecological, and political values and institutions. The goal of a native economy is to nourish and sustain that people's distinct sense of identity, belonging, place, balance, and relationships with one another and the natural world, enabling them to flourish on their own terms. Since time immemorial, Native peoples have flourished through their sacred design and maintenance of sophisticated, adaptive economies, often in the face of harsh conditions and changing circumstances. At the heart of a Native economic life were robust local and intertribal systems of commerce. Everyone in the community contributed to these systems, male and female, young and old, leaders and followers. Rigorous training practices equipped individuals and groups with specialized knowledge and skills to make those contributions. These training practices also instilled the value of reciprocity, the profound obligation to play their designated roles, and a deep understanding of how community members' well-being relied on the contributions of others. They were basket weavers, food harvesters, canoe carvers, fishers, tool makers, large and small game hunters, hide tanners, corn growers, and the list goes on and on. Called social entrepreneurs today, they were resourceful and tireless. The community counted on them to sustainably produce and provide vital goods and services that promoted the common good not just for today, but for generations to come. Traditionally, Native peoples also embraced a deep abiding commitment to recirculate these economic resources as many times as possible. They did this within the community through gifting and exchange, and beyond through wide-ranging trade networks with other Native peoples. They understood from long experience that by prioritizing this interdependence, or as some people call it, the multiplier effect, they would maximize long-lasting benefits of their economic contributions so all community members could flourish. All right, that's video one, and let's move on to video two. Colonialism turned Native economies upside down. It decimated native governance institutions and trade networks and severed native peoples from the places they depended on for their sustenance. Instead of prioritizing regenerative activities that cultivated, circulated, and grew local economic resources within and between native communities, colonial policies and institutions extracted economic resources from native communities for the benefit of dominant society 
They did this until those resources were diminished or destroyed. A native community's livelihood once depended on everyone in the community doing their part. But now, economic development involved only the few tribal leaders and citizens who were needed to secure the removal of resources from native lands for the benefit of non-natives. The economic health of native communities was no longer determined by native agency and production, but rather by outside market forces and the ulterior motives of states, Congress, the administration, and the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, native social entrepreneurs, once the wellspring of native prosperity, were actively excluded from this new economic equation. The devastating effects of this systematic suppression of native economies endure today, including tribal economic strategies that focus only on launching large businesses that the tribal nation can own and operate, increasing federal funding to support community members and attracting outside investors to the community, limited opportunities for community members to play the valued economic roles they once did which has made some people dependent on the government for their welfare and prompted others to take their talents elsewhere, a dynamic known as brain drain. Widespread disregard for native entrepreneurs as an economic force, leaving them little access to the infrastructure, resources, and technical assistance needed to start and grow businesses in native communities and driving those who do largely underground. Weak local systems of commerce with few places for community members to get what they need, forcing them to venture outside of the community to do so. Severe economic leakage where the financial resources a Native community has immediately leaves it before it can recirculate, greatly weakening their power to bring lasting benefits to the entire community. Limited community understanding of and appreciation for the core cultural value of doing business with one's fellow community members and native communities that are economically isolated from one another with little, if any, trade between them. Overall, the systematic suppression of native economies has left native communities with limited ability to foster self-determined economic growth and long-term community prosperity. All right, and then last but not least, the third video. Um, this hopefully will get everyone energized to uh, figure out how to um, strengthen entrepreneurship in your communities. Over the past several decades, a self-determination renaissance has swept across Indian country. Tribal nations are uprooting the oppressive colonial policies and institutions that have greatly harmed their communities by once again seizing the reins of self-governance. In the process, they are rebuilding native economies that enact their cultural values and long-range visions for a vibrant future. For a growing number, this means reconnecting with their age-old entrepreneurial spirit by making the cultivation of local small businesses owned by tribal citizens a central foundation of their efforts to revitalize tribal systems of commerce and foster sustainable economic growth on their own terms. These nations are forging blueprints for success, featuring effective strategies that are proving useful for other tribal nations. These include implementing a trauma-informed plan to help tribal citizens heal and become prepared to play the roles that revitalizing the tribal nation's economy require, codifying a comprehensive small business development initiative in the nation's economy rebuilding approach and dedicating the financial and human resources it needs to take root and grow defining the distinct type of businesses the nation and its citizens should own and how the citizen-owned businesses can help meet the community's needs. Assessing the current state of the nation's economy, including the severity of economic leakage from the community, how to stem that leakage by working with native entrepreneurs, and the nation's capacity to build a thriving citizen-owned business ecosystem. Creating a robust system of tribal laws to foster citizen-owned business development and growth like a uniform tribal commercial code. 
consistently enforcing those laws through an independent and properly resourced judicial mechanism that fairly resolves commercial disputes, building a culture of accountability to those laws through ongoing tribal leader and staff trainings and community education, helping citizens launch and grow small businesses through streamlined business licensing, site leasing, and related regulations, education, training, and technical assistance, financial assistance, and building the physical and digital infrastructure they need. Providing native entrepreneurs with integrated support like startup and growth capital, training, business plan development, and market feasibility studies through partnerships with native nonprofits, CDFIs, co-ops, tribal colleges and universities, chambers of commerce, small business development centers, and others. Developing an economic profile that documents the skills and interests of the tribal workforce, the citizen-owned small businesses in the community, tribal and regional market forecasting, and how the citizen-owned business community can evolve to meet future market needs. Creating a procurement policy requiring that tribal government and tribal enterprises do business with certified citizen-owned businesses first and other native-owned businesses second and helping those businesses become certified. Launching a permanent Buy Native campaign so that everyone understands the financial, social, and cultural benefits citizen-owned businesses provide. Promoting local citizen-owned businesses to other Native communities, the surrounding region, and the world. Modestly taxing citizen-owned businesses and reinvesting that revenue in their growth through loans, marketing, training, and technical assistance. Holding the federal government accountable to its trust and treaty obligations to fund native small businesses and engaging state governments and philanthropic partners to do the same. Learning from the innovations of other tribal nations to strengthen the nation's development of a healthy ecosystem for citizen-owned businesses. And celebrating successful citizen-owned businesses within the community and beyond. When tribal nations embrace these strategies, they nurture a vibrant economy producing a multitude of benefits, including more local jobs, keeping more dollars circulating within the community, and keeping talented, hardworking tribal citizens at home, a reduced cost of living and an improved quality of community life, the emergence of new role models for Native youth, and ultimately, a strong and resilient foundation upon which to flourish as Native people once again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this was really a team effort, as Jeff mentioned um, and Kobe mentioned. Uh, we had we we had uh, worked with many months with uh, about a dozen content contributors from across any country, um, you know, leaders of native CDFIs, uh, leading scholars, um, folks that have been doing kind of the grassroots uh, small business development work uh, across native communities um, to make sure that, you know, the messaging was on point and, you um, and that um it was really hitting all of the 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 right tones if you will um so we're we're gonna now uh, dive into our panel without further ado and I'm, I'm really excited to bring these uh these two panelists together um and and i i learned uh in in the minutes before the webinar started that they already know each other so there's a familiarity there that's great um and i i i know you guys are gonna have questions that arise as they as they share and so if you want to just uh, place your um, your questions in the Q&A, you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen a Q&A um, button there. You can just throw your questions in there. And then after they're both done sharing, uh, we'll move into a moderated uh, Q&A and discussion. And uh, we'll get to as many of your questions as, as possible. 
Um, and so with that, I'd like to uh, begin with Elsie and we're gonna, I've got a few questions for Elsie and a few questions for Cecily and then and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, seed the conversation that way. And so um, Elsie, uh, it's it's great to see you again. It's it's um, uh, it's been quite a while and you know, Elsie and I go way back uh, when I was uh, working at the Native Nations Institute, which worked closely with the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development, um, Elsie was on their Board of Governors, and so I've had the the, the benefit of of accessing her wisdom many times over the years, and so it's great to have you with us to share about a a topic I know you care deeply about and you're immersed in daily, and so um, you know I'm curious as someone who has worked for decades to to rekindle entrepreneurship in Native communities. How do you see the growing movement among tribal nations to center small business development and tribal economy building? You know, what is driving it and, and what from your view is preventing it from growing even stronger? Uh, well, thank you, Ian. It's good to see you all. And I don't get out and get in to go to conferences very much. So um, it's kind of exciting. Um, you know, I feel like these videos and all that is, I mean, it's really what we started talking about 30 plus years ago when we were developing Lakota funds. And, um, you know, I mean, spot on exactly. You know, there wasn't a private, in fact, our mission for many years was to build a private sector economy at Pine Ridge because all the money flowing in was, <clears throat> you know, government funds, federal government um, Pretty much that was it. And all the employment was government employment. And there were really just a handful of businesses. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to really just kind of set the context by telling abbreviated story of Lakota Fund because it's a really long story. <laughs> um, but the businesses that were here were almost exclusively owned by non-tribal members. And truthfully, there was only just a handful of businesses. So, you know, to start down that road, you know, and you think about it, you think about if businesses, and these are all small businesses. So, you know, mom and pop, who do they hire? They hire their family members. And in this case, there's non-tribal members for the most part. I mean, that owned the business exclusively, but for employees, so people hadn't even had the chance to work in a business, let alone own a business or manage a business. And so, you know, when to have any success at all, and I mean, believe me, we had many failures. I mean, we just, we didn't know how to do it, what we were doing, how you really conquer that sort of, you're trying to do business lending in an area where there hasn't been businesses plenty of entrepreneurial spirit, but um, just haven't. So, you know, where do you start? And it was really, you start by developing the person. You start building those blocks. And, you know, you start by providing financial literacy and you start by doing business training and you start by getting people checking and savings accounts, which the majority of our borrowers had never had a checking or savings account. And that, you know, that was pretty kind of eye-opening when we, when we did a little study of show who had had loans, hardly any of them had ever had a loan before because there weren't banks. And so anyway, um, you know, I, I wish I could say that we took every step in the right order, but, you know, our, thought and our whole focus was on providing loans and so we started there and that was really the wrong place to start but ultimately we learned our lessons and you know to make a long story short you know i look at the difference in our in our communities there's really not hardly a non-indian business on the reservation and especially you know where it comes to for contractors um, you know, it's almost all tribal members in business. So, um, and the reason this is happening and, and the only places I see this happening are on reservations that have a strong CDFI. It helps if you have tribal government um, support, 
And, you know, for the most part, I'll say at Pine Ridge, you know, we just kind of flew under the radar for a long time and tell our success was such that, you know, if somebody got turned down for a loan and they went to a council member and said, you know, they're not given, they're only given their family members loans, which we didn't do. Um, we really um, could show them why. And, and we stuck to our policies and, and uh, so anyway, there's a lot of lessons to be learned here and I'll stop there because I could go on for a long time. And I, I don't know if that got to any of the questions, but I just rambled. It did. It did. Thank you, Elsie. And, and I know um, having spent quite a bit of time up at Pine Ridge over from the late 1990s into the, about the mid two thousands, um, just seeing the, the transformational change that was taking place within the community just over that less than a decade period where, you know, a, a, a town like Kyle, um, you know, on the Pine Ridge Reservation went from having, you know, virtually no businesses owned and operated by, um, you know, tribal citizens to this, this community of businesses that were growing up. And, and you could just, you can almost viscerally see in front of you the multiplier effect taking place, right? The dollars staying local, being generated locally, staying locally, and the, the transformative impacts that's had in terms of, you know, not just business owners, but as you mentioned, you know, business owners growing and going from being, you know, so one employee businesses to then they can employ a certain few family members and, mm -hmm. and, and what that does to the, to the, the self-esteem and the sense of hope in the community. Um, you know, having, having uh, chatted with you about this uh, topic many times in the past, um, I'm curious to get your take. You know, one of the key messages in the videos is the fact that entrepreneurship um, is a, is a, um, deeply rooted indigenous principle and practice. It's not something that is being foisted on tribes now as some sort of economic nirvana. This is what tribes had divined out of their own experience as something that they needed to prioritize. They needed to um, systematically grow um, in order to be uh, a thriving community. And I guess I'm curious, you know, I know you've been you've been a messenger on this for so long. How do you see the level of understanding among tribal leaders, key decision makers, um, and citizens about about that fact, and about the fact that, you know, if if native communities are going to prosper in the 21st century, that that small businesses have to be a key uh, component of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's been a, a shift in thinking um, over the long run. Now, I mean, when we first started, people that were in business were assumed that they were rich and it, there was all kinds of misconceptions. And I'll remember, I'll, I'll tell you one story in particular and uh, Lakota funds and others helped start Pine Ridge Area Chamber of Commerce. And, and part of their mission was to really try to affect tribal policy. And so one time they decided that the tribe decided that uh, the land committee that they should increase commercial leases, commercial rates of leases. Well, you know, really the only the only uh, regulations we had were regarding grazing lands. <clears throat> so they looked at Rapid City and they came back with this preposterous um, amount that they were going to charge people that you know for, and it was just space it wasn't it wasn't an office building it wasn't a building because there were none of those and you know everybody had to build their own business their own their own building and the the chamber of commerce members when they found out that was coming to the floor got a hold of the council members one by one and explained the importance of, of small business and when it came to the council floor i mean they got shut down really fast like what do you have against business against you know our people being in business and so you know that was just one small victory but I can you know I can name others too so oh can't hear you Elsie so a follow-up on that and and I, I I recall that story um you know when it took place uh many years ago I think that's indicative of a lack of understanding about both the benefits of entrepreneurship and also what running a, a small business really involves and, and how, how really you're on the margins every single day of, you know, staying in business or going out of business. And it's, it's a fine line you walk as an entrepreneur. Um, 
I guess a follow-up question. I mean, do you, I guess, how, how important is it for tribal governments and tribal leaders to put their money where their mouth is when it talks about, when they talk about supporting small businesses? To me, you know, and as the video points out, where we've seen success really take place, um, a couple of things are going on. One is the tribe is um, the tribe is educating in an ongoing fashion its own people about why these uh, small business owners in their community are so critically important. And then secondly, they're they're putting in uh, laws, policies, et cetera, in place to not just support their growth, but also to uh, directly do commerce with those businesses through procurement policies and so forth. Um, so I guess as a follow up to that, I mean, do you see that that tribes can play, uh, tribal governments and leaders can play a greater role in this area? Um, and, and where do you see some of the deficits? Um, well, certainly. And, you know, and it varies from, you know, the least the least a tribe can do is no harm in some ways to businesses. Let them operate. And then start building, slowly building good policies, good laws that help support them. You know, sometimes, you know, tarot is a great thing, but sometimes it's sort of a, a de detriment to a small, mar a business with a small margin. So to really understand, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing education to understand, you know, what it takes to run a small business. And you know, to allow tribal businesses. I think there are certain businesses that tribes shouldn't be in at all. And one is retail, grocery stores. There's a small margin there. And, you know, it's to understand what it takes to operate one of those profitably um, is something that, you know, I think there's been this education process going on. Hopefully it's getting learned, but, um, but yeah, you know, and, and I have to say, um, at the risk of just going on and on, you know, it it was a hard process, I think, for people to change because, you know, we'd sort of developed this poverty culture. And I remember when we first started, you know, people would, you know, we were Lakota funds and they would say, well, what does that mean? You know, were, were we ever in business historically? We weren't. And this one time we had some training and it was from this guy that he's from, I think he was from one of the tribes of Wisconsin, but uh, it was our board and staff. And he was talking about our road to development and, you know, how, where we came from and the things that affected us and, you know, and of course war affected us with, you know, white, white folks. But, he talked about, you know, when they went from the horse, from the dog to the horse, from the bow and arrow to the gun, nothing changed our culture like that did. Nothing. And no one sat down and said, well, I thought about this later. Like, I bet no one sat down and said, oh, this is not culturally appropriate. <laughs> you know, we've always used the dog. We've always used the bow and arrow. And now you know, what, a horse and a gun? Well, it just made life better. It made it survival better. And that is the way we started to couch, you know, to explain this is not something that isn't within our culture. We've always had some commerce. We've always survived. We were survivors and really entrepreneurs are that. They're risk takers and they're survivors. And so I think just having the experience of people being in business now and, you know, making deliberate efforts to educate has really helped. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, good, good segue to um, Cecily. And um, uh, we've talked about entrepreneurs and I know Elsie, you've been an entrepreneur for many years and um, didn't have time today to get into your various ventures, but um, Cecily, you, you are, you are right now a native entrepreneur and, and, uh, as many native entrepreneurs uh, do, you have more than one uh, business uh, active. And um, and so, you know, as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, kind of the same question I uh, posed to, to Elsie, how do you see the movement among and the need for uh, native nations and communities to focus, you know, greater time, energy, innovation, and action on reconnecting to that entrepreneurial spirit that sustained native communities traditionally? So I had a whole two hour drive to the airport here to be thinking about all this. So I'm gonna try and condense it. 
Um, and I also would love to just invite a reminder to folks like stretch a little bit, look around. If there's something green in the distance, look at that, reset your eyes a little. I should mention Staring that Cecily's a life coach, just, just for full disclosure. <laughs> Can you tell? Um, so, um, yeah, I was really thinking about this and I don't have the experience and expertise that Elsie does. I just have what I've been really earnestly learning, you know, over the last 10 years or so I started a nonprofit work and now I have these two businesses that came because I just kept trying to find my role. And I noticed in the videos, there was a conversation about how traditionally, you know, we all had a role. We knew our roles. We were taught our roles. There was a lot of emphasis on that. <clears throat> and I think now, rather than having kind of a web of interconnected relationships and roles that are rooted in interdependence, we kind of have this like factory of we're born, we go to school, we go to college, you know, or we quit school and we go and we go into the workforce. And there's just this kind of lin very linear process there. Um, <clears throat> and don't, I mean, nothing, you know, totally wrong with some linear things. I love a good spreadsheet, but um, I really feel like there's a level of um, that role uh, instilling that can happen at an early age. What role do you even play in your home? You know, bringing toddlers into that, bringing your partner in conversation into what role are we playing here? Um, and there's a ton of stuff. There's these cards called fair play that I think are really cool about all the different tasks that have to happen in a home. And in some ways, I think there's an opportunity to do that. What are all the different tasks that have to happen in a community for us to feel that sense of nourishment, thriving, et cetera? Um, and so <clears throat> the other piece that stuck out to me from the videos was around self-determination. And as you mentioned, I, I do the, the coaching work and I really feel like, you know, we live in a very hyper individualistic society. And so there's so much focus on the individual. And so the environment is kind of conditioned to that, to, you know, go and work. And I think one thing that we can kind of finagle with that structure is if we're going to have that focus on the individual also focusing on how do we as people show up in community as individuals how do we show up in a way that honors how we're playing a role in community and I think entrepreneurs do that in a way that is almost maximized like we we really pull our guts out put them on the table in some ways because um entrepreneurship deals with money which deals with every single possible fear, doubt, moral implication, all of these different things that people, you know, deal with in any household. But when you're taking it on, you don't have a boss to be mad at. You just get to be mad at yourself. You know, <laughs> the decisions you make, the boundaries you hold, all of it. Um, and I really feel like one thing that our overall structure could do is think about that environment. How are we setting up conversations around money and finances that are um, as you mentioned in the video, trauma-informed, there's a trauma of money program that really helps around the social, emotional, all of those other components that go into talking about money beyond dollars and cents and the kind of cut and dry, um, non-emotional attitude people have toward money. It's a very highly emotional subject. Um, and so I think that when it comes to nourishing a, an ecosystem that honors the role of entrepreneurs, it's important that we have um, folks <clears throat> in positions within the tribes, but then also, you know, in the community have opportunities to get versed in that. Because like Elsie mentioned, well, people who have businesses, that's for that's for rich folks. That's not that's not the truth, but it's a strong mentality because business has been such a gatekeeping space. And you have to be really creative and tenacious to be able to succeed in that. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I know you probably have another question and I could keep going. Oh, you're on mute. I'm glad you stopped because I have a great follow-up on that. So uh, <laughs> that's not the truth. You're right. Um, entrepreneurs are, by and large, Native entrepreneurs are not rich. And, and that's not the goal either. They don't start businesses to get rich. And, you know, um, working with a lot of entrepreneurs at Pine Ridge back, back in that time period I mentioned, I was struck by again and again, you know, people saying, I didn't start this business to get rich. I, I, I started it to um, provide a service to my community, to to be there for my community, to get to, to provide them access to something they wouldn't have access to before and provide opportunity to community members um, where otherwise that opportunity wouldn't exist locally, where they're going to have to go off the reservation and find a job instead of, you know, working for me. Um, you know, there's there's there was one entrepreneur who she had grown her business to 40 or 50 employees. Those are 40 or 50 employees that either wouldn't have a job or if they did, it would be somewhere far away where they're they would have a whole different um 
cost of living calculus, for example, in terms of how to make ends meet because they're having to drive two hours to Rapid City or where, or what have you just to work each day. Um, so I guess, how have, you, how have you navigated this and how would you like to see, particularly, um, particularly um, that ecosystem for entrepreneurs be strengthened in and around tribal lands. Um, you know, as somebody who, who wakes up each morning trying to figure out, or maybe, maybe doesn't sleep at night trying to figure out um, how, how am I going to not just keep my businesses going, but actually grow them um, to better myself, better my family, um, you know, do more for my community. Um, what would you like to see um, tribal governments and leaders do more of? Oh boy, that list that list could take a long time. Um, and I think it's different too. I want to just honor too that the the you know particular conditions in my community, my tribe might differ from other folks, um, as might the you know particular values or priorities. And so I think in in my mind, some of that has to do with like where are you at and what do you know about your community in relation to this need? Do you have a baseline, not just like a gaps analysis or needs assessment? What's the big picture? What do you know? Um, what are you missing? What are you curious about? What are people curious about? I think that's a really, really excellent starting place because it's hard to know where you want to go if you don't know where you're at a little bit. Um, so that's kind of a, just an initial statement. The other thing is, I think, <clears throat> you know, the dimension we talked about, I can't remember if it was before the call or during, but um, COVID changed so much in terms of how we had to adapt. And I think we we shouldn't sleep on the fact that um, we have we have agency like that is something that we as individuals should not forget and we as tribal members should not forget so being able to really um in the other question you mentioned there was this thing around innovation right and i think it's an opportunity to like how do we um increase our like ability to try some out of the box ideas and i really want to honor what elsie said around you know we tried things we kept trying until we figured it out and i think that tolerance for um like the the learning gap to be able to just try things over and over again until you refine and figure things out. Um, I'm trying to decide which thing to prioritize. I will say something that I said in my first question or in response to the first question around people kind of having that time to really dig into who they are and what their role is. I think we could build that in to components of our community. If we took opportunity to say, you know what, we're going <clears> to <throat> make it so that at this time people get time to learn different cultural practices they haven't had the opportunity to do, those things can become viable, right? Like that's, I mean, so many, so many people in our communities already have arts practices as a viable business. Um, but a lot of that sub-economy, if we took some time to say, wait, if our long-term goals are really to see revitalization happen, how are we really shifting that? Similar to what you said around you know, um, putting money where your mouth is in relation to supporting small businesses. I think we also have to support those people who would make them run. What are the obstacles that they're going to have? You know, they, myself as a small business owner, I have shifted so much of my time to smaller hours and really, really aligned work. I'm not wasting people's time. They're not wasting mine. I'm giving something that is deeply of value, my hope, and in return, there's an exchange of that reciprocity there. The rest of my time goes to doing community work, to create, you know, doing parflesh work, doing anything that I can to be out in community with people. That's a benefit to me of having a business that I necessarily wouldn't necessarily be able to do in the way I want if I had a 40 hour week job. So um, I don't know if I answered your question. I got way more I could say. No, you did. You know, you're you're immersed in community. I think that's that's, you know, a, a an eternal truth about native entrepreneurship is that they were immersed in community then and now. And, um, you know, I've, there, it's not a mistake that the, the overarching theme of that first video in particular focused on traditional native economies was, you know, everyone traditionally had a valued role to play and there were systems in place, very detailed, meticulous systems in place to prepare um, people from all walks of life to play those valued roles, um, to contribute a good, to contribute a service to, the community, and then and then support the circulation of that, the exchange of that within the community, and then often, as I mentioned, with with other native communities, and I and I just I'm I'm left with this in hearing you guys talk, and in and in doing so much research over the years, and in in preparing these and helping to prepare these videos, I'm kind of left with this inalienable inalienable <laughs> truth, which is, you know, 
we, we know that the top down outside in approach to tribal economic development is a failed formula, right? Outsiders calling the shots, thinking they know what's best for native communities. That's a failed approach, right? And, and what worked before was bottom up, inclusive, inside out, right? And to me, can you, can you realistically expect to get to that again without having a robust private sector, without having that robust mix of, um, of entrepreneurs um, active in your community, not having to go elsewhere, but, but active in and around your community, able to stay at home or be close to home and participate in the community as well as to run a business. I think that's key. Um, so yes, Elsie, go ahead, elaborate, please. Um, well, C Cicely is so right on um, about everything she said. One thing I'd just like to add is <clears throat> what what tribes and tribal leaders can do is to really recognize their role versus sort of the private nonprofit sector. So, and because it's really the private sector, CDFIs, for instance, that do help grow the economy. I mean, they're the one. I mean, they're the ones. They get do technical assistance, get people into, you know, bring capital to the table, and so to understand that they have a role, that there is a role for that. And I think that's really important because, you know, I think tribes, government leaders, council people, one of my husband is also on the council. So <laughs> um, to really understand that if by supporting that, I mean, if they actually then spoke up for the CDFI fund, tribal leaders, because that they, the CDFI fund, Department of Treasury, sends a lot of money to native CDFIs. And that's what helps support, gets this economy rolling, not tribal businesses, but individual entrepreneurs. And I just think it's so, the more we grow our tribal members, I think the more effect that's gonna have on our whole nation. They're gonna make better management decisions. They've suffered the consequences for bad decisions and they've reaped some rewards for for good decisions and that's what an entrepreneur finds out they make mistakes we made mistakes at look out fund we were given a chance to do that thankfully but i mean that's one thing that i think you know if, tribal leaders if they fully understood the value of cdfis and other nonprofits that help do this that that would be really helpful yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, as someone who works very closely with Native Community Development Financial Institutions, uh, you're absolutely right. They play a, a very unique and vital role in, in in reviving this this entrepreneurial ecosystem across Native communities. And I think it's incumbent upon tribal governments, um, particularly for those that that haven't chartered their own Native CDFIs. Um, some you know some tribes have done that, like Citizen Potawatomi Nation in Oklahoma is an example. Um, but for those native CFIs that have sprung up separate from the tribal government, it's important for the tribal government, as we point out in video three, to to build that partnership to to figure out how can we how can we let you do what you do so well as a native CFI and support that by you know raising the spotlight on your successes by um, advocating for more funding from the federal government for those entities, et cetera. Um, I wanted to move to Q and A. We do have a few questions um, teed up here, and the first one is is for Elsie. And, um, you, you know, you, you shared a little bit about the Lakota funds and um, and questions from Tracy Stanhoff is about um, is about, you know, loan repayment rates. And, and can you share, you know, some examples of some of the businesses that Lakota fund uh, helped uh, get off the ground that are now thriving there at, at Pine Ridge? Um, so. At what period of time are our, our, our loan repayment rates in the beginning were terrible because we didn't know how to lend and we didn't have an educated base of borrowers that most of them never had a loan. Most of them never had a checking or savings account. None of them had ever been in business. But when we stepped back and did it right, I'm happy to report that the Lakota Fund has a, a delinquency rate of less than 2%. I mean, that's right up there with the banks and their loss rate is, you know, less than that. So, I mean, they're, they're doing a really good job. 
Oh gosh, the businesses that have been helped. Um, I mean, we've got grocery stores that have had great success. Um, every time somebody asks me this and I just draw a blank, but trucking companies, um, you know, they're, they're actually doing a lot of ag lending now, recognizing that that's part of the economy too. And um, contractors, I mean, one contractor, of electrical, plumbing, carpentry, you know, building, you know, house builders. So the list is, you know, it really, it goes on. And they've been able to do a lot more as far as like provide training um, stipends for contractors to hire people so that they can start building a workforce. And then ultimately more people could get in business then too. So um yeah, hope that answered the question without it, it does. And and um yeah, and I know and and again working with a, a lot of native CDFIs and having opportunity to sit down with a lot of their uh chief um chief executive officers and and hearing them talk about about their lending records. Um they they often cite similar data that you shared about Lakota funds that, that their their uh loan delinquency rates are lower um than conventional banks. Um and I think it's part because they're invested in the community. Um, they're based in the community and they're going to do whatever it takes to help that entrepreneur succeed. They're, they're not looking for them to, to default on their loan so they can repossess something. They want them to succeed. Um, so, uh, Cecily, I, I want you to lead off with, with uh, addressing this question. The, 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 the next question um, focuses on, um, as we know, is, you know, we live in a digital age, the global marketplace. Um, a question basically deals with the pros and cons of um, tribal citizens starting online businesses, some of the challenges, some of the benefits. Um, I know I've checked out your websites, you're marketing your, your businesses online. So what's that experience been like? And you know, what, what is your perspective on that question? Yeah, no, for sure. This is a huge question, I think, with a huge range of answers. One, um, online business for tribal members, of course, then there's the question of, do you have access to reliable internet? Because if that's your business and that's your income, you need to make sure that you are, you've got the best internet you can. I've had to get two separate lines because it won't work with one in my household. Um, and so I think, you know, how to get started with it. I think you have to know what is, what is the gift that you're offering? What is the thing that you're offering that people are interested in receiving? And, um, what is your level of excitement and, and engagement around that? Because sometimes people see entrepreneurship as kind of an escape from the nine to five, and it can be, but it also is not something that you're doing. Um, if you're going to just like slog through it, that's that's a really difficult path to go on. Um, I would say that there's a ton of opportunity if there's something that you have in mind to be able to sell, whether that's a product or a service online. Uh, and the pros and cons, I would say that um, some of the pros is you can work from anywhere, right? So even if you go on a trip, if you um, you know have a child at home with you, it's difficult, but it can be done. And that's part of the reason that I made the switch was because I had my daughter in 2019 and being able to work from home was really, really important to me. Um, some of the cons I would say is that you lose out on a lot of the relationship building of in-person time, the water cooler talk, which seems small, but it's actually really, really big. So there's a level of isolation to it that I think you have to intentionally combat. Um, I think the other piece, this isn't a pro or a con, just a thought that community around you, having a community of other entrepreneurs, I think is wildly important too. So trying to tap into different groups, whether it's a Facebook group, whether it's whatever, just being able to have access to other people going through a similar struggle, um, because entrepreneurship is a very, it's a roller coaster. And so you want people who have been on that ride. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think in the, the digital realm, figuring out what you really want, what the functionality is. Do you want a website? Why do you want a website? What service, is it required? Or is it just something you want to say you have it? There's a ton I could say, and I'm always happy to talk to anybody about that process. Some of those things are just things like our brain wants, because it's like, oh, well, I can focus on something tangible versus the actual relationship building that is the root of all businesses, in my opinion. Um, so I'll pause there. Yeah, thank you for that. And um I know that in working with some tribes, you know, like uh, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, for example, um, Confederate Sales Kootenai tribes are doing a lot to 
uplift and market their native entrepreneurs through like an online marketplace um, themselves instead of, you know, obviously they, th these entrepreneurs can have their own websites if they want, but they're also trying to amplify um, what they have to offer, um, not just within the community, but beyond um, because they, they're recognizing and wanting to grow the value of that. Um, so uh, one, we, I think we have time for one more question I wanted, and this deals with business plans. Um, I know Elsie, as a, as a, as a co-founder, co-designer of a native CDFI Lakota funds, and then Cecily is an entrepreneur yourself. Um, the question is about business plans. And, you know, when you have people coming to you asking you for money to start a business, you know, they, they, they have to have a, a plan in place. Right. And so I, I guess what, what needs to go into that, you know, to make sure that that, that business is structurally sound it's sustainable through, you know, not just startup capital, but growth capital. And then also what's the lay of the land, you know, what's the, what's the market where they want to play, right. It, you know, if they want to, if they want to, um, you know, just market on reservation, they want to market beyond reservation, um, you know, globally, um, how, do, how do they find that niche and make sure that what they're, what they're wanting to do is going to be ultimately successful? Um, well, one thing I'll say is, People that really realize the value of business planning are those that have been in business and struggled or failed. Because a new entrepreneur, their business plan is so aspirational. I mean, it's just and not reasonable, generally. I mean, we used to sit down and try to do business planning with people. And they would never take it that we'd say, this is unrealistic. And they just thought we didn't want to give them a loan. And I mean, it would be some preposterous forecasts and et cetera. Who's your competition? Well, we don't have any. <laughs> and, but what we, when we started doing small business planning and putting them in a room, this probably really goes to what Cicely was talking about, getting that, you know, the effect of people being around you. You know, they would start talking about their business in class, keep talking about it over a six week period. And I know this one guy, um, he wanted to raise horses. Well, I know something about that, but, and we hadn't given him a loan because it's, it's an iffy business. <laughs> and so he came to this class and he worked through the projections. He worked through the, you know, expenses, all of that. And at the end of the class, he says, I'm so glad I came to this because now I know this will not work unless I have a full-time job <laughs> and I don't think I'm going to do it. And it was, it was a, it was a big relief for me. So it's so important, but I mean, I think, first of all, you have to really build that. You have to realize the importance of how important it is. And I think, you know, people are kind of at that stage now here is, you know, they've had enough experiences and so it's it's become a lot better. Before we, uh, before you shut me off, which I wouldn't blame you. Um, one thing I wanna say, you know, we touched on why people get into business here and it's, you know, they don't wanna get rich. Well, let me tell you, I people would come in and say, well, I don't wanna make money from this. And I, we would say, no, we want you to make money from this. You have to pay your loan back for one thing, but also how do you support your family? How do you ultimately help support your community? And we started changing our language to say, this is about wealth creation. We should be talking about how we can build, become prosperous and build wealth. Because otherwise you can't help yourself. You can't help anybody around you. And our tribes have sold poverty for a lot of years. And and when you focus, it, it just sort of, I mean, this is talking to the poorest county in the nation, the people. But when you start saying, no, we can build wealth, it just kind of gets your eyes up to a different level. And so we really started that and talking about savings and, all, you know, everything we could to get people going down a path towards self-sufficiency instead of dependence on tribal government. Yeah, it's, that's a great point. It really reconnects him with the, with the sort of the, the final word in the in the in the videos there in the third one there. Cecily, final word before we wrap up on that on that point. Yeah, so um, I really appreciate everything that Elsie had to say because I really feel like that's that to me relates to that trauma money conversation. And 
I'm also a certified trauma money facilitator. So I'm throwing that out there, but <laughs> it's a very, very like it's, it's, it has transformed my life. And I think it has the capacity to transform businesses in a really, really powerful way. Um, but the one thing I'll say is folks who are curious about starting a business, but not there or in the, like, if you're in a job, start viewing things through that sieve of like, oh, man, you know, it's easy to complain about all the things that are wrong at work. But then think about that, like, oh, well, maybe there's a management plan that would be better or an inventory system that makes more sense or whatever. Start looking at things through that lens of what would I do? And be curious rather than it's really easy to complain and to gossip. We can all do it professionally. But I think um, to be able to go ahead and start thinking of that, like the sense of possibility there, and then immersing yourself in unique stories, the traditional business model is not set up to include us as women, as people of color, as indigenous folks. Um, I love Rachel Rogers. Uh, she has a company called Hello7, which stands for Hello7 Figures. And it's all focused on folks who are minorities, folks who are women, um, being able to actually succeed in business and not by some of the traditional routes. And so I think um, on the business plan piece, I want to say you have to decide what's necessary. Are you trying to get an investment? Are you trying just to live off the revenue you're going to make? Figuring out those, that's part of the business plan. Whatever it looks like, you can decide. Or if you, there's somebody who's going to be looking at it, they all have some input. But just that continual process of learning, um, it's great to have a business plan, but you have to have it be something that isn't going to hold you back and you'll get analysis paralysis. Engage with it. Love it. Be excited about it. I'll, I'll stop. That's great. That's that's the spirit of the entrepreneur right there. Well, Elsie and Sassi, I really appreciate you taking time um, to share with us today. I know how busy you both are. And um, and I did want to uh, flag that Suzanne um, placed in the chat a couple of related resource videos um, um, that are that are that go into uh, greater detail about some of the the, the uh, themes and and points that we we explored today. Uh, the first is a, a presentation by Robert Miller, a very well known uh, native scholar who teaches at the Arizona at Arizona State University who's been writing on the subject of uh, traditional native economies for for decades. And then the second is a um, is a panel that NCAI brought together during, uh, I think it was the first year of COVID, where we were talking about what what you guys referenced earlier that that um, the impact of COVID on the the native small business economy, and also the fragility of tribal economies overall, and and how important it is to have a, a more robust uh, small business ecosystem in your community so that you you have more. Um, businesses that are going to continue on when perhaps your tribal enterprises are, are, are having to be shut down for various reasons. Um, so I wanted to flag for folks uh, our upcoming webinars. As, as mentioned, this is the first webinar in a four-part webinar series. Uh, and we're going to be uh, we're going to be going at a fast clip here. Our next webinar is this Thursday, January 25th. And we're going to have um, Heather Fleming, uh, who runs Change Labs at the Navajo Nation. Uh, and she's all about um, strengthening that uh, small business ecosystem there in her community. And then also Sean Lawrence from the Lummi Nation. Um, and uh, he's going to be uh, on hand to share about how uh, they, um, Lummi Nation, used a multi-year um, community engagement uh, process to um, more fully center entrepreneurship in their tribal economic strategy and some of the key things that they put in place since. Uh, so we're really excited about that webinar. And then we have two great webinars next week as well. Um, and you can, um, you should be registered for all four uh, if you registered for this one. So uh, just make sure you have those on your calendars. And I also, just in wrapping up, wanted to uh, mention too that uh, in addition to these three animated videos, we're going to be um, releasing soon, NCI is, um, two companion guides to the videos. One is going to be a companion guide for tribal nations and leaders. And then the other one is going to be a, a companion guide for tribal colleges and universities to um, to use the videos as a teaching and learning tool um, to uh, engage in certain activities to help you take what you've learned and turn it into action. And so we're really excited about that. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to again, thank our panelists today, and we hope to see you again on Thursday and have a good rest of your afternoon.